I welcome everyone to the 25th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2017. And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of this meeting. The first item of business is a decision on whether to take agenda item 5 on a work programme in private. Is everyone content that item 5 of this meeting be taken in private? Thank you. The second item of business is two panels of evidence on the Children and Young People Information Sharing Scotland Bill. This is the fourth meeting where we will be considering the Bill. We have already heard from the Scottish Government's Bill team and members of the legal profession, health service professionals and local authority representatives in relation to education and social work. This week we have a focus on schools and early years in the first panel, followed by the Information Commissioner's Office. Before I take evidence, I would like to place on record that, as agreed by the committee, the Deputy the Convener and I met with the Cabinet Secretary yesterday to discuss the themes of evidence and some of the concerns raised by members during evidence sessions so far in relation to the Bill and the Code of Practice. This was to ensure the Government is cited in the committee's concerns, such as on the lack of a Code of Practice to inform scrutiny of the Bill and the current status of parliamentary scrutiny for the Code under the Bill. We hope this will enable the Government to actively consider the Committee's concerns at this relatively early stage in scrutiny. And can I now welcome to the meeting Gillian Ferguson, Deputy, a Deputy Rector for Pastoral Care on behalf of the Scottish Council of Independent Schools, Lisa Finney, President of the Scottish Guidance Association, Mar Maria Pridden, Classroom Assistant and Member of Unison, Lorraine McBride, Head Teacher and Member of EIS, and Christine Kavanagh, Network Chair for the Lanarkshire Area National Day Nurseries Association. I should say to the panel from the outset that if you would like to respond to a question, please indicate to me and I will call you to speak. And can I remind members that supplementary questions should lead on from the question being pursued and is not an opportunity for you to ask a second question. Okay, uh, I'd like to start with Gillian. <laughs> Thank you, convener, and thank you to everyone for coming along to give us uh, some information today. I would like to ask about your current practice with regard to information sharing about children that fall b beneath the threshold of, of, uh, of child protection, but go into the, I suppose, the realms of well-being. Um, and uh, if you could tell me just, you know, how you do that at the moment. I'm happy to start. Um, we are in the independent sector committed to the GERFEC approach and, and we do have interim guidelines. Much of our colleagues across the sector have a commitment to getting it right, but our current practice would be on a policy-based um, model and adhering to consent-based um, principles, really. Um, I think there's quite a lot of anxiety around sharing information um, that doesn't meet the child protection threshold. Um, so we would be seeking consent and sharing with that consent. And I, I have spoken to a number of colleagues, um, and really the practice isn't that we would share information without that consent. Lisa, Lisa Finney. Yeah, I, I would like to agree with a lot of that, that we wouldn't be sharing information without consent uh, as far as possible. Obviously, the, when it goes into child protection, it's completely different. However, I think it's been acknowledged before that there's quite a lot of information that goes between people on a daily basis. And there is, a, again, anxiety around just being able to always record when, when consent has been sought. And maybe if there's a difficult circumstance, that's, I think, where we're a little bit worried. And that's maybe where we'd like a little bit more clarification. It's all very well when everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet, the parents are looking for support, the pupil's looking for support. It's very clear if you're making a referral and you've got to record a signature, etc. that's all very good. But when it gets into the more complex ones where there's maybe a reluctance to involve social work, etc., I think that's where we're looking for a little bit more help. Does anybody else have any? Further comments to make on that? I think I would just totally agree with that. Um, the issue is when parents do not want you to share information about their child with, it could be police or social work, they're happy for you to share with health professionals, but not with other agencies. I suppose then your child protection issue, you know, procedures would then kick in and overrule that. But I think we do need a bit more clarity and a bit more guidance okay. around that. Can I add one thing? Um, in the past, there have been sort of examples where we haven't been allowed to take things forward because the parents have said no. But there's always something that then changes in the future. Either we find another way around it or things deteriorate and it becomes child protection or the parents get desperate. So maybe a difficulty that arises for one moment 
doesn't remain a difficulty. There's a pathway there, and that's maybe where we need to work together. So, there, um, an inability at an early stage, mm -hmm. potentially, because you can't get consent, can sometimes escalate into a child mm -hmm. protection issue. But there can also be the problem as well, where if it's an early intervention, it might be that we're told it doesn't, the case doesn't meet a threshold, mm -hmm. so we can't get help anyway, but at least we would have known. Yeah. So in terms of, of the guidance that you're looking for, I mean, there's an opportunity for you to tell us when the Code of Practice comes out in mm -hmm. its final form, what, what you as practitioners would want from it. Um, obviously, around consent would be something, but I, I'm happy to hear you. I mean, I think most people that I've spoken to are very much in agreement with what we're looking for. I think we all understand that there needs to be quite a heavy document to begin with to get everything covered, and we're all happy to do that. But I think because so much happens on a daily basis, and you've got maybe a, a frantic meeting, flow diagrams have been mentioned, and I think all my, my colleagues would like is this, is that, do you, do you, that kind of ready reckoner to be sure you're on the right lines. And also um, we're looking for a bit more scenario based training. And again, it's going back to these difficult ones. It's not the, the ones where, you know, there's been a, an incident, this, that we've all dealt with every day. It's the more unusual ones. How do you find a way around it? And that's what kind of training we're kind of used to anyway. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Julian Ross. Thanks. Um, there have been some suggestions with uh, previous panels we've had from other sectors about defensive practice becoming an issue. I'm wondering if with the, the debate, the uncertainty around this over the last year, has that changed practice already? Are you seeing people uh, do this differently? Or? Lena, Guy. Um, when the Act was passed, we saw an increase in communication um, because we're unique in the independent sector, we per perhaps don't have the same communication um, that local authority schools do. So I had seen an increase in communication in my own practice, but also I'd heard from colleagues. And then with the Supreme Court judgment, I would have said that communication has decreased. Um, and we were really positive about the, the better lines of communication that we had with external agencies, with service providers. But I would say that has definitely decreased um, since the judgment. Anybody get any other views? Please. Sorry, I'll try not to speak all the time. Um, it's, it's difficult. Uh, <laughs> I would say that it's, it was more of a case of relaxing into being allowed to share information. My colleagues haven't reported a change in their behaviour. I think it's how they feel about it that's the difference. The only thing I think I was reflecting on the other day was I think there's more times where people would share hypothetical situations more often. So rather than having the confidence to, right, I've definitely done the right thing, this is okay, they might say, if you had a child where this happened, what would you do? Would I go to the right person? And you might actually run something by social work that you maybe wouldn't have in the past because you would be confident that you'd got the right decision. So maybe we're a little bit more tentative and anxious rather than not sharing at the appropriate times. I think we, we did feel we were sharing what should be shared and not sharing what shouldn't. Does anybody else have any? Uh, Roger, sorry. Yeah, sorry, just uh, well, from where we are at the moment, how much of a change would the duty to consider represent for current practice? From, from where you are now, what difference would it make? I, I think the difference that it makes, it, it, I suppose it gives you if you have a concern, it gives you a, a kind of a, a backing to, to work with that concern, even if it does mean that the parents aren't happy um, with whatever you wish to, to share. You know, we all should be working together in the Gerfec agenda. That's the whole point of it, that everybody is doing their best for every single child. And when barriers are put in front of you, it's quite difficult to then meet the needs of a, each individual child. So... If we are then able to say, well, actually, I'm going to share this because I think that's in the best interests of the child as the named person, as that person who has responsibility to make sure that child is actually okay. And yeah, it might be against the parents' wishes, but I have a real concern. To be able to do that, I think might... I mean, you would, that, I would be seeing that, you know, from our point of view, that would be a very, very unusual occurrence where parents don't want to work with you for the best interests of their child. But it would give you 
I don't want to say a bit of clout, but it would, it would give you the backing to be able to do that in confidence that you, you're doing the right thing for that child. The, the duty to consider, I think a lot of colleagues are already considering what am I doing with this information? So I don't think in that respect it would change what we do. I think the next question we ask is, can I share without consent? And that's where the problem is. Um, because as, as you said, Lorraine, it's about um, it being an unusual case. It would be very unusual cases, I think, where you had a parent um, or a guardian who was at odds with you working towards the best outcome for their child. But those cases do happen, and I think that's where we would maybe benefit from more guidance in terms of the can I share without consent for us. Thank you, Liz. Just on that point, can I just ask about the practical level of um, when you do have to make a decision about whether to share the information? You're seeking guidance about both the law and also the code of practice you would expect to give you that backup. Can I ask you just on a practical level in terms of your daily lives in schools and um, uh, working with very young people, does that produce a greater burden on you to have to do more paperwork? Would you be able to comment on that? Absolutely. I mean, everything, to be honest, everything to do with GIFREC causes a burden on the person who's having to do the paperwork, um, the de facto named person at the moment. Um, there is a huge burden about the, the administrative side of that, the confidentiality side of the paperwork. Um, it's, that's increased and increased and increased um, over the, the, the... To the extent of um, preventing you from dealing with other things, would you be able... To could you, could you give us an example of what... Um, for example, if you are dealing with, um, say for example, health visitor phones you and they need something there and then basically, mm -hmm. you have to then go access the, the information, pull it together, get that into a document, it then has to be sent securely. And all the time you're thinking, oh, who's, who's in? I'm supposed to be in that class doing a monitoring visit, I'm supposed to be speaking to that, there's a wee one, I want to catch up with him, I wanted to check in. You know, so... The job for me as head teacher and for our members as head teacher members and deputy head teacher members, you, you very quickly your day can get filled up with that one mm -hmm. piece of paperwork that you need to pull together because it is important and it does need to be done. Does it need to be done by the head teacher? I don't know. But then if you're then given it, there's a, a fine line there because there is the confidentiality thing, you know, I, to, to then say to someone in your admin team who's already overworked and underpaid and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, here's something else and I need you to drop everything else. You know, I, you know, I, I know you're doing the, the absences, I know you're doing this, I know you're trying to phone people and find out where their children are, but I need you to do this because they need it by 12 o'clock. So there is an additional burden on your time. And what happens is, I'm sure we're all the same, we extend our day and extend our day and extend our day beyond the contractual hours so that we can get all those other things done in case, you know, because these things happen all the time, mm -hmm. you know. Lisa Fanny. Thanks. Um, it's, it's exactly the same with, with us. I feel we do three jobs, that we do the job during the day, which is the phone calls, the emails, the, the, te the teaching, <laughs> um, the children appearing at the door, the, the sudden immediate incident that's blown up after the weekend, etc. Then at the end of the day, the children go away, and then we start the next job, which is trying to get things put into seamless as you watch the circle go round and round. Um, finding the bits of paper, putting things away, all the stuff you have to do when you're actually at your desk. And then you go home and do the third job. And that's where you do the things that you can do from home, and that's the 3 a.m. job. And then that's when you get teased for sending emails at silly times. But realistically, it's three jobs. And the only thing I can kind of say as an analogy is it's like asking the checkout girl to go and fill the shelves when she's got a queue. You can't do it. And it's, it's impossible to ask people to do it. But you do do it just now? I wouldn't say I was doing everything I meant to do. I find that very, very difficult to come to terms with, but... Okay, thank you. Uh, Claire? Thank you, convener, and thank you, panel, for coming in this morning. I just want to ask a, a, a brief follow-up question on 
not that last question, but the one before. Um, so I think we, we all accept that, that if there's child protection concerns, then that, that trumps everything, essentially. Child protection concerns, you raise those regardless of, of consent. But you were saying it's, it's about issues that, that are below that threshold. And I think it, we just need to really be very clear about that. It's about issues below child protection thresholds. What do you currently do now when you have those? And how frequently do those come up? Um, I'm the classroom assistant. And very often we work one-to-one -one with vulnerable children or children who are class refusers. So we, we will take them out of the class and we will spend a lot of time with them. At the moment, the information sharing is purely verbal. There's no diary system, there's no set system, so we do need some guidelines of, as how, how we can share the information, what's happened to this child today, um, how's that going to affect the playtime, the lunchtime, the going home time, any transitions that they might have throughout the day. Um, it's, it's purely verbal at the moment, so we would welcome some kind of guidelines. Within your your own education establishment, that is purely verbal, because I, I would imagine that there must be some written records. Um, if what well, if the child has come in in the morning and has disclosed that they've had a, a bad morning, that's that's relayed verbally. That's not because as a classroom assistant, we do not have pastoral notes and we don't have access to CMIS. Right. So, so we would tell the teacher right, okay. this is what the child has said or we would tell other classroom assistants this is what's happened to this child today sometimes we don't get a chance to say that if there's no time to try so we just do our best to try and pass on the information that we can Kavan. in the um, independent nursery sector our, our nursery heads are not the named person it's the um, health worker health I'm not necessarily talking about named person I'm talking <coughs> about how, how you, you yeah, no, I just suppose it's, it's extending a little bit from what Gillian Martin was saying so so what would you do if, if it wasn't a child protection issue currently yeah I understand and um, yeah I understand that um I was just going to say that, that very often the, the the nursery head has to act as a coordinator for issues that are not child protection so they may well be dealing with a number of different professionals um, who are all very overburdened as well. And ag again, like it's been said before, very often dealing with one child or trying to help one child to get the best outcome for that child does overwhelm everything else that the, the, the management team should be doing. So it's it's about trying to juggle, all, keeping all the balls in the air, try, trying to keep juggling everything and making sure that you do get the best outcomes for the very vulnerable children can sometimes mean that the children that, have less um, critical issues get missed because there's just not enough time in the day to do everything. I guess, sorry, convener. Yeah, I know. I, we're straying off though the, the question I was asking, which is what you do currently. We current well currently our, our our managers. We do have a record. We do keep a chronology for in the private sector, we just keep chronologies for children of issues that they have. And it would be down to the individual nursery manager to try and seek to find support for the individual children. OK, okay thank you, uh, Oliver. And then Joanne and then Tavish. Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of leading on from that round, the workforce pressures you're talking about. I just wonder whether the, in terms of recording uh, decisions that have been made as part of this duty uh, to consider sharing information, uh, well, well, do you think that will create more workload, and particularly uh, in terms of sort of head teachers? You know, if you're doing that for hundreds of different pupils, do you think that that will lead to an increase in workload? Can I answer that one. Um, uh huh. <laughs> Absolutely. I think for head teachers, but also for in the secondary sector, um, principal teacher pupil support. If that's the road that that goes down as well. Huge issues there, huge issues, probably even more than for the head teacher, um, because they have a teaching commitment as well as, as everything else. Um, I think we have to be very careful that what we do, what we record, what the, the paperwork that we are submitting, etc., doesn't overwhelm the issue that, that we're dealing with. Um, I, I think that that's a big thing, um, and I know that you know within various authorities that, that across the country. It's things are put in place in different ways. Um, and some authorities have gone gung ho and 
put everything in place and there's paperwork galore. Other authorities have held back, waiting on decisions, etc. Um, but I, I do think we're, we're at a time where, especially for head teachers, recruitment of head teachers is a, just dire. And people don't want to do the job, which is a shame because it's a fabulous job. And it's, it's a great place to be, to, to uh, work with children and young people in that, that capacity. But as the workload increases and increases and increases, and this is one small part of that increase in the workload, I worry about the, the next step for, for just the recruitment and retention of head teachers. Mm, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'll let you uh, go first. Can I come back in after? Yeah, of course. Aye. Can I ask, I mean, uh, really what you're saying is that the workload of head teachers is, is heavy, which mm -hmm. is a different thing for, really from what we're we are discussing here, and I accept that what we are talking about will have some kind of extra uh, addition to that workload. But if the, the, the guidance is such that it's pretty straightforward about how the, uh, the reporting mechanism goes on, will this not just become part of what you do anyway? It will become part of what, what we do. However, the worry is then that the, the administrative support for it isn't there. It's the paperworky bit of it that increases it. It's, you know, the talking to children, the drink, bringing together of, of people to have a meeting, etc., etc., etc. That's the job. That is our job just now. That's what we do. But that additional recording and minute taking and, and all of that, you need somebody to be able to help you with that in the role that, that we do as head teachers or deputy heads. You're talking about uh, resources or...? It's the resourcing of it, uh-huh. Right, OK. Yeah. It's just to clarify yeah. what it is, so the, the aspect of what we're talking that about. That part is the part that increases the workload. So it's the paperwork bit? It's the paperwork bit. Yes, yes. OK, thank you. Uh, Oliver, you wanted to come back. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, in, in the event that there were in considerable additional resources, do you think you've got enough time to implement this properly? That remains to be seen, okay. really. I mean, I suppose we would we would all be trying our best to implement mm -hmm. it properly with those additional resources. And, and that's sort of other half to my question. Do you think that the, the sort of pressure and sort of burden on your time has the possibility to lead to mistakes, you know, however unintended being made in terms of some of these, when we're talking about some of the children uh, that in, around the welfare issues that maybe are harder to spot, do you think that the pressure and less time you know, to, to actually spend with the kids themselves makes, you know, or opens up the possibility of mistakes being made. If it's not well resourced and, and supported, if head teachers aren't supported within that uh, process, then I think, yeah, things can get missed. Uh huh. Especially low level. The lower level things can get missed, which are sometimes the things that are the most important. It's not a crisis, but it could escalate into a crisis if it's not caught early enough. But as I say, it's the resourcing yeah. of that and the support for the, the process. Okay. The need for name person, haven't you? The low level stuff that we're trying to stop before it becomes a crisis. Yeah. Uh, okay, sorry, uh, Joanne, the Tavish. And I suppose I'm interested, first of all, in which of you are named persons and if you are a named person, how many young people are you a named person for? Well, I was a named person, then I became an establishment contact last year when they decided there wasn't a named person, but I am a named person. But yes, that's the role that guidance teachers are, are undertaking. Do you be responsible for Over 200. And if, as a head teacher in a primary school, how many? I'm a de facto um, named person. Um, I've got 240 children. And so it's, it's not, I mean, I wondered whether in secondary school the old model of guidance teachers is it any different but it's got added admin is that the difference um it's it has changed dramatically but it's been mostly additional work as, as i think you're acknowledging and the traditional guidance role isn't really possible to do as well as we used to and then there's the additional pressure where we're supposed to be looking at revamping pse which we see is very important as well how do we do everything at once, so, effectively? So being a guidance teacher is in the old model, which I knew, the go-to person, somebody yes. you could talk to, somebody you could say, can you speak to my teacher because they need to understand there's been a problem here. That bit of your role is it's diminishing? It's less possible to do it the way I want to do it. OK. Um, and I suppose this, the other question would be, 
if there wasn't a formal named person role, in, and you say, so you're not going to have the admin bit, what, what would we be losing? I mean, I get that you might not want to do the paperwork, that's an extra burden that's getting in the road, but if we say there is a named per per person, what are you missing if you've not got a named person, if that makes sense? Would your job, would you, it's not that your job would be in terms of dealing with children who are in need, would that change? Or, or are children more at risk if we don't have a named person? I'm not sure if I'm answering this correctly, but I would probably see that there is a need for the named person in terms of delivering fair and consistent approach. I think that was one of the first things I read about the, when the guidance came out was that, yes, this is what we're doing, but it's trying to make sure everybody has, has access to it. And what I'm seeing at the moment is not a consistent approach, but if it was done the way we want it to be done, that's what we could deliver. And that's where the, there is the risk that there is a child somewhere that because there isn't the process, the legislation, the procedure there to make sure that it's implemented correctly and that we know how to do it, that they are missed and that there is a serious problem okay. for a child. The key thing is resources, though. The key thing would be resources. Can I ask Maria, um, who you said already that I mean, a fundamentally important job, which is getting intelligence and understanding what's maybe happening to a child and feeding it back into the system. Does the fact there's a named person make any difference to that very important job you've got? Um, that would help support the child, definitely, yes. So if it's something that, that what you were saying really was taken as, as mattered somehow and it was put somewhere, you was a guarantee of that? Yes, yes. Christine and then Gillian. Yeah, can I just address the question about um, what would the implications be if there was no named person? In the early years, I would say that it's critical because um, early years is not um, statutory education, so there's no statutory person that's, that's there for the child. So while for us in independent nurseries it's difficult because we might be dealing with maybe 15 or 20 or more health visitors, it's still important for the child that, that there is a consistent contact there that, that, that everybody can approach. And that, so, yeah, I think it's very important that there is a person. It's about the professionals, it's not about the child. Yeah, OK, but somebody who has that child's best interest at heart and whose, whose purpose is to make sure that the professionals who should be looking after that child are looking after them properly and that are bringing all the strings of the care together. I suppose I would say to the guidance teacher, it's a we've ended up though, where there's a consistent, is that right? There's a consistent contact for the professionals, but your ability to do that day-to-day -day contact with individual children is reduced? Yes, that's where you need the resourcing to pass it on appropriately and get the support that's required. And again, this is going into ideal practice, you know, taking things forward. But I think how I envisage it is that you notice something's gone wrong with one of your, your children that's been brought to you by either a teacher, you've noticed it yourself, the child's raised it, a police report's come in, whatever. But then you have somewhere to, to go with it, that you have got CAMS help, that you have got uh, social work support, you have got third sector. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Tavish? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to test the um, very fair points you're making about uh, resources and workload against the uh, fact that what we're being asked to do is, as a parliament is look at a change in the law and the fact that change in the law is about um, uh, creating a duty to consider uh, and that some of our earlier evidence and the panels we've had has been about what that will mean in practice. Um, so I take all you say on resources and believe me on workload. I have plenty of head teachers at home telling me all about that every single day. But are you, do you have concerns about the bit before the resources and administration, which is this new duty, if Parliament passes this, that will be laid upon you, and then how you make that assessment, and whether that adds in, in principle to your to the aid to the decisions you have to take and the, and the workload that you therefore have, long before you get into who does the administration behind it. Thanks. I think the the worry there is that as individuals, the duty to to, to share, etc. In legality, we are then. We're then liable in some way, you know, the named person service as a whole, you know, it is the, the duty on the authority to, to, to make sure that that happens. But I think there is a real concern, you know, round about head teachers that because it becomes a duty, that that legal 
ease round about that. There's a real worry there in case we get it wrong, mm -hmm. you know, and and you're then, you know, you're thinking, oh, you know, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to me? You know, and there's a worry there. And before you get to the workload, before you get to anything else, that worry for for all of us who are in the profession, you know, we worry about the kids all the time. We worry about doing the best for them all the time. But when you're then worrying about a legal thing above you as well, you know, but I, I, I appreciate it's the name service. So, but I think that needs to be made very, very clear. And that is for that to be? Uh, not to be individual head teachers, to, to be the named person service that has, the, you know, the duty there. And they have the responsibility to ensure their head teachers share. But I think it's, it's, there is a real worry there. So you'd rather the, what, the, 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 what an individual pupil didn't have a named person, it was the service as a whole that was used in terms no, of that legal assessment? I or? think basically the named person is part of the is part of the named person service and the named person has duties towards that individual yeah. child or, or responsibilities towards that individual child. Um, but I think in the decision taking to be held legally accountable for that, there has to be some protection for, yeah, for head teachers. Yeah, but that's and not currently how it's considered. I think, I mean, you as a head teacher ultimately be that person, particularly given the governance yes. proposals make you uh -huh. even more responsible for lots of other things. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, Maria Pridden wanted to come in, then Gillian Ferguson. I think it raises the question about the training that's going yes. to happen mm. beforehand, mm. so, uh, and how efficient the training is going to be. Is it going to be ongoing training? Um, is it just going to be um, the computer programme training or is it going to be kind of part counselling, you know, showing people how to counsel the children? Mm -hmm. yeah. We all have child protection training once a year, so, so at that level, um, but this is slightly different. So is that, that ongoing training that we need and need to make sure that that's in place and we all know what we're doing? Mm -hmm. Can I just echo, um, Lorraine's talking about you know, the anxiety of head teachers um, and Lorraine has the backing of a local authority. We are slightly further down the road that, that you're proposing um, in that we are independent schools are autonomous. Therefore, that anxiety, I think, is even greater. Um, and we might worry about um, envisaging more legal recourse um, on a more regular basis, which has implications for all schools, um, because of that shared liability. It's a named person service, but I, as the person, I am the, the de facto named person currently, I am concerned about my shared liability with that service and, you know, eventually, at, at the end of the road, the, the governing body, um, who are really the directing authority. Um, and I think it does come back to the, the code of practice being clear enough um, and in a language that's not too um, tending towards the legal that teachers and practitioners can actually understand. And that would be the key to the success of it. And I do think it has potential to be really um, powerful for improving outcomes at the primary um, prevention early intervention stage, but we need that to be really secure and accessible. So you share the concerns that we've heard already that the, 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 uh, it is a draft, but it's written by a lawyer. And I, I'm not a lawyer and I can't follow it. So, so how do practitioners follow it? So it needs to be written in language that we can all deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Julian, you wanted to come in. Yeah, just a supplementary on that, just to pick up on what you're talking about, about feeling that you might be personally liable. Is, is the case, you know, there's quite a lot of, of uh, legislation and rules that you have to follow already. And should there be an issue where maybe there's a, a legal recourse from someone you wouldn't be personally li liable for that at the moment, would you? It would be the local authority that would be pers would, would be liable. Uh, but I think so how would that be different in the case of a named person, do you think? I think it's just, uh, we're just saying, you know, there needs to be clear guidance on mm. that. But that um, is the case, isn't it? That you are not personally going to be standing up in front of a court defending something. Uh -huh. which, well, yeah. Yes, uh -huh. we work yeah. for local So authority. there will be no difference when the le this name person legislation well, I don't comes know. in. <laughs> we don't know if there will be any. Right, difference. so you need that. You need, need that clarity. That clarity, yes. But that is the case. Well, when at you. Uh, right, let's not have a roundtable discussion about this. We, we were told yesterday that individual wouldn't be legally liable, but. What we, by the government the bill team, what we do need and what the government need to do is they do need to do exactly as you've said. They need to make that perfectly clear 
to every practitioner that the, their legal status would not change from where it is just now in terms of doing their job, because the last thing in the world we need is people like yourselves who are keen to do this to be worried about doing it because they might be held legally responsible. They made it clear to us yesterday that uh, it would be local authority or whoever uh, the body would be. All of us want to come in now and disagree with me. I, I'm actually n not convener. Um, I wondered uh, if the, just as a sort of lead on from that point, whether you've got concerns around, uh, you know, a stage down from being legally uh, responsible in terms of professional standards or how you might be, how uh, concerns that were raised by service users might be dealt with within your own organisation and, you know, how much, you know, whether that's an additional pressure as well. Uh, yeah. I do think that there is an anxiety with that. I, say, I don't think we're all necessarily waiting for a legal writ or something, but there is just this, you will, uh, you will get the blame as such for something. And because it's something new and because it's so high profile, if something goes wrong, it wouldn't just be that, oh, a teacher didn't mark a bit of homework or something. It's going to be something that is so critical and so worrying. And people are concerned. OK, right. Uh, I think the government will get the message that they have to make it very clear about who's responsible for this. OK, thank you very much, Daniel. Just before I ask my question, I mean, the, 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 the evidence given by both the Law Society and the Faculty of Advocates was that it, it wasn't clear um, that, about the personal liability. So I think it's worth putting that on record. Um, I just want to really ask some questions about the clarity about when you'd share. I mean, there's been a lot of questions, or, or comments rather, about the need for clarity. And just following on from Tavish Scott, I mean, what were your reactions when you read the, the illustrative code of practice? Do you think it, it, it's, it's adequate for what you need? No, convener, can I answer? Um, I, <clears throat> when I saw the, the illustrative code of practice, um, to me, um, from my, my threshold of child protection, I could apply it. But for the threshold of well-being, I couldn't see how that would apply in terms of seeking... Um, to share information without consent. So you would share without informing or without seeking consent. Um, and I think that's really problematic because apart from very, very exceptional cases, I can't imagine where that illustrative guide of practice would sit with that threshold. So I suppose really what would help is if we had an idea of what the trigger might be. And I know that's a really difficult one to define. I understand that. And it comes down to the, the definition of well-being um, and how we measure that. The tools are there and that's helpful, mm -hmm. but perhaps there's some confusion around well-being across the board, across practice. And that's why we're looking at the illustrative code and thinking, I can't imagine where I would share information around included, for example, without consent. That mm -hmm. wouldn't be a breach mm -hmm. of Article 8 or the Data Protection Act. The vital interests part of the Schedule 3 of the Data Protection Act is quite clear in terms for me and practitioners like me in terms of child protection, but not, not at a lower threshold. Mm -hmm. That's what worries us, I think. Mm -hmm. Are there any other sort of comments about that? No, I mean, what, I mean the scenario indicators are, are very broad and I think they're very welcome, they're, 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 they're useful, but, but they... they they, they lack definition and are often raise uh, aspects which are subjective. In a previous evidence session, the example of taking a child up Everest might be uh, uh, an example of good parenting to one parent, but, but uh, something harmful to another. Uh, it, it, I mean, can you think of examples where the scenario indicators would provide you know, information or types of information that you would share that currently you couldn't, wouldn't, or might be hesitant to? So, so the, finally, the, 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 in our, the, the evidence that we had from both the Law Society and, and the Faculty of Advocates, they, um, I think, in a number of different ways, highlighted the fact that, that that duty to consider is a very finely balanced one from a legal perspective, and one that even as, as, as lawyers that they would find difficult. What, what concerns do you have um, as practitioners about getting that legal judgment right? And, and do you think... That, that you currently kind of are equipped to make that uh, legal judgment. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We go answering it. I think we worry ourselves sick every single day about every decision that you take. 
yeah. we think we're confident in, in our abilities to make decisions about children. We think we have the knowledge to do that. If you know your children well, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the Shinari indicators are a good indication of how children are doing. Um, it is subjective, but most experienced people who are doing that can work out what children yeah. are, are seeing and where it all fits in. Um, but it's, it's back to the whole legal thing again about being sure of yourself. We need to be, we need to have that clarity round about if we make that decision, are we doing the right thing? And if there's that duty to consider again, you know, I don't think as, and I don't know if much training would help us to understand that either. <coughs> I think we just, we, it, it, it's a difficult, difficult situation that you're in. It's hard enough making decisions about the children without worrying about this duty to consider, you know, it is a big thing. If, if there's a you know, in-law, a duty, it, it just makes everything that bit bigger and that you'd second-guess yourself more. Can I also add that the, the duty to consider is one element of it, but then the evidencing of that duty is quite problematic for me. Um, so we have the duty, we could consider, we have, you know, a very, very good... Um, national practice model, the resilience matrix, the wellbeing indicators, the My World Triangle, that works for us um, across the sector. We use those tools, but how are, I think the link between that is quite a leap to the evidence of the duty to consider, and perhaps um, more guidance for that would be helpful, just so that we have the security of knowing that we're doing it the correct way, which is what we all want. Okay, thank you. Before I bring Colin in, can I just clarify then? The, what seems to be coming across here is that a lot of the things that you, you'd be getting asked to do, I mean, you're already making decisions on well-being every day, eh, aren't you? So a lot of, the, a lot of the, the things that you've been asked to do, you're already doing. What you're concerned about is protection, and we can have a debate about if it is or not, but if, you've, if there's clear... Guide, if, there, if there's clear notification that you're not going to be held responsible, that takes a big burden off your head. And the other is that you need the code of practice to be written in such a way that all these things you can just, as you say, flowcharts, etc. And that would help it. It's, I, I accept it's not quite like that, Tavish, but uh, that's exactly what they've asked for. Uh, uh, Colin, you wanted to come in. Yeah, can we do? Um, Gillian Ferguson uh, mentioned in relation to well-being. <laughs> that there's no common understanding of that term. Uh, I don't know if the rest of the panel agree, and I'd be interested to hear, but does the term well-being need statutory definition? Is it possible? Um, I thought I knew what it meant till I heard that people didn't know what it meant, and now I think mm. I don't know what it means. So <laughs> up until now, I was pretty sure that you know there was the welfare thing, and that was more child protection. There was a, a significant harm kind of element to things, and then well-being to me was just shinari when there was something wrong. Maybe the child wasn't particularly behaving in a safe way, or they weren't doing particularly well. Something was going on. I just thought that was well-being. I thought it was quite straightforward, but maybe it's not. So I'm, I'm worried now. <laughs> I was fine last week. <laughs> Can I add that when I say there's no um, standard definition or understanding of well-being in our practice, we're quite secure internally of what that means. But I think we come across difficulties in interacting with service providers who perhaps have a different um, understanding of it. Um, so I think, although it's very difficult to do, it might help if there were to be some kind of broader definition that we could follow. And currently we've got assessment tools and we're comfortable with them in schools, but um, what I apply in my school might not be the same um, as another school, another school's practice. So we are aiming for parity of practice and, and I would love that. Um, so anything that can help to deliver that would be very welcome. So are we saying that uh, each group of practitioners has a common definition but that may not be the same as the next group. Sorry, if I can, can I come in? Yeah. Uh, it's more about a kind of a well-being threshold, mm -hmm. you know. So, at what point in a child's well-being indicators, if you're doing an assessment, at what point is there a commonality that we would say we need to do? We, no, mm -hmm. we've, we've done all we can internally within the school, we've put in supports, etc. We now need to involve someone else. I think there needs to be a commonality across the country about that. And at the moment, you know, we would, we would have it in, 
our authority, but the next neighbouring authority might have a different understanding, you know, within because of their training. So they all have the same commonality, or maybe they don't, maybe from school to school, it's a wee bit different as well, from secondary to primary, um, et cetera. So I think a, a guidelines on, on that commonality of threshold would be quite useful, just to go back to what Gillian was saying. Should it be statutory or in the uh, code of practice? I would just like to, um, just before we move on to that, build on the, the point that uh, Lorraine made that what's very secure in one establishment or even one authority might not apply across the board. And when you're working out with the education authorities, we're working, we our members of our organisation very much working on their own, that what's secure in, within one establishment might not transfer across. So it would be very helpful to have it defined somewhere, whether it's the code of practice or whether it's independent from that. Um, it, it would be very helpful to have it defined somewhere. Is it definable? Um, I think everybody has their own definition of well-being, don't they? And I think it's a, it's a consistency. And, and, you know, the point of clarity and consistency of practice is what one of the things we're here to talk about. And, yes, well-being is definable. Um, but whether everybody would agree to one person's definition would be something else. I think a common theme that seems to be coming forward is clarity and consistency. Does the bill actually achieve that? I realise the code of practice is not out there yet. Does it? I think that's your answer. Yeah. I think you've answered your own question. With yes, code I think practice, so. But it's the second week, darling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Liz, you wanted to come in. Just to the point of information, uh, convener, the panel absolutely correct that, that the Supreme Court ruled that the definition of well-being uh, was not, um, you know, other than the Shinari indices, it was, was not um, seen in law, and therefore the panel are quite correct in flagging up the fact that there is no legal definition of it. That's the problem. Thank you very much for pointing that out, Liz. Uh, Oliver, you wanted to ask. Uh, um, it was just to ask, when the, the, this legislation first came forward, uh, and we were talking about a duty to share. Uh, was was that a more comfortable was that a more comfortable sort of process than the duty to consider? Are you more comfortable with the duty to share? I don't than think the duty it made much difference to me. I just want what, whichever one it is to be clear and have training, have worked examples, have scenarios, just as long as I know which it is. That didn't make a difference to me personally. Okay, because you said, I mean, some of the panel said before they didn't like the idea of having a, a duty in law in terms of where responsibility lies. Is there a difference in the type of duty or is it just the duty full duty. stop? Still, it's still, still the duty part of it, really, regardless. Yep. Okay, no, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, that's fine. Yeah. Right, thank you very much. Oliver Daniel, if you wanted to come back in. Briefly. The name person's in place, that's not what we're talking about. You can share information when it's a, a question of child protection. This is about information sharing around wellbeing. Can I just ask, is what we're discussing today actually something that people on the panel actually want? Do you think it, it's useful? Just briefly. Do we think it's useful to share information? Specifically on, on, on well-being well -being in terms of what this this specific yes. this yes yes okay. it's a requirement if we need service if we need to access service um, providers in terms of support for a young person um, and we have consent to share that information um, then absolutely we'd want that provision for the young person to get the best outcome but do you mean sharing without consent well that's um, part of the issue we've got. Um, that if I'm looking at a particular case where I, I think it would be helpful to share the information because we might access this, um, then it gets back to the compulsion on the part of the parent to engage with the named person service, which isn't there and is, was never intended to be there. It, so we're left in a position where we have to say, well, we think it would be best. Um, and I've 
you know, we've all, I think, had occasions where we've, we've requested perhaps to be able to share information and we've maybe had, well, you can share that piece of information, but you can't share that. Um, so we can get partial consent. But in the event of a parent saying to us, well, no, I, I don't want that information shared, or the child saying, no, I don't want that information shared if they have capacity, then we would be doing two things, monitoring very closely and looking to see if we had a better other solution um, that was more creative that could achieve the same outcome. Um, but it, it does get back to the name person service and the, the fact that parents don't are not compelled. And I think there's a lot of confusion around that, which is a slightly different issue, around whether they can opt out of the name person service. Um, it's there should they wish to access it. Um, and we would want to share information to help the young person. But if we can't, um, then that's that's a legal issue in terms of the Data Protection Act and what we're, why we would be sharing the information and how we would define vital interests. And we're comfortable with that at a child protection level, um, but not perhaps below that. Yeah, that's helpful. Okay. Is that it, Nana? Right, thank you very much. Uh, in that case, can I thank you very much for your evidence and for your time this morning. That was very useful. And we'll cl we close the suspended session for a moment or two to allow the witnesses to leave before continuing on to the second panel. Thank you very much. Okay, can I now welcome to the meeting Dr. Ken MacDonald, Head of ICO Regions, Information Commissioner's Officer, and Maureen Faulkner, Regional Manager in Scotland, Information Commissioner's Officer. And I'll go straight to questions. And my question is, we understand that under the new Data Protection Bill, your office will have a role in preparing a data sharing code of practice. 
Could you explain how the Code of Practice was developed for the 1998 Act and what approach you plan to take for the development of the new Code, including the likely audience, use of plain language, practical examples, etc.? Um, yes, you're, you're right. We, we have a statutory duty to produce codes of practice under the existing Act, and we have had one code of practice which was a statutory obligation to, to prepare itself, and that was the one on information sharing. That was published in 2011, and um, we, we have a standard approach when we're developing them. We draft it internally, we seek views from stakeholders, we review it, we um, amend as appropriate and we make sure that it's in plain English. I think anyone that's uh, been working in data protection since the 98 Act came in will have seen a sea change in the way in which our guidance is published. The very first was very legalistic, in fact it wasn't really much different from the Act itself. But over the years we've moved to a much more uh, practitioner and uh, citizen friendly um, style of, of guidance. It's in plain English, they give examples, and we listen to our practitioners and we try and make these examples relevant to them. But there is input from it, we do consult, etc. In uh, what way would you consult? In, in, in this case, for example, who would it be that you'd been consulting with? It, it, it's in different, according to, to, to the guidance that we're um, preparing, it's in slightly different ways, but we would um, consult with interest groups. Uh, we do produce our guide, our, our consultative document. We make it available for a number of weeks, six or eight weeks. We take in the responses and we, we amend a, a, as appropriate. I think one of the good things that we do is to set up a, a band, if you like, of critical friends. Um, so we, we welcome uh, constructive criticism. So we would bring on board people that we know would perhaps have an issue with whatever guidance or documentation that we're trying to put together. Uh, and, and we basically let them loose on it and say, please come back you know, with uh, any criticisms that you have, and then we take them on board. So I think, I think having critical friends is really, really valuable when you're trying to put guidance together to make sure that it's, it's addressing the salient issues and that, uh, as Ken says, it, it's in plain English, it's there for practitioners and the public to understand. Okay, thank you. Liz, would you like to come in? Thank you, Convener. Um, Dr MacDonald, in your note to the committee of the 3rd of October 2013, um, under the legislative competency bit, uh, you acknowledged that a number of witnesses uh, had made the point uh, about questioning whether the competency of the information sharing aspect of the bill um, <laughs> was actually in line with uh, Article 8. And you also acknowledged in that meeting that uh, you would go back and consider Professor Norrie's comments because you had some concerns about that. Could I just ask you, after that reconsideration, what advice did you give to the Scottish Government? I can't recall. I mean, that's now four years ago. Um, I, wrote, I know that I wrote to the committee at the time that the, the, the bill was going through. I did write um, to the clerk at one point uh, saying that there had been some, uh, one of the amendments, well, our big concern at that time was the relevancy of the information that was going to be uh, shared. And of course, one of the data protection principles is about uh, relevancy and you can only share um, information which is relevant and that's not excessive. And the way that the bill was originally uh, framed, we didn't feel, uh, met that criteria for the, the Data Protection Act. There was an adjustment made and we wrote to the committee in December of 2013 and what we said was that while the change was um, from might be relevant to likely to be relevant addressed our, um, our concerns, it was, only to, to, it was only to a large part. We weren't, we weren't satisfied and we were never totally satisfied that the bill as written was going to be, had specified the level of data sharing that could go on um, uh, satisfactorily enough. To be clear, did you put that point to the Scottish Government that you were not satisfied that it was fact? They, like, they saw that email as well. They, they were copied into that email. Sorry, you, you, you advised them that, I, that there was I, a legislative incompetence. I, in I, I sent the email to the bill 
and as it was a addressing an amendment that had been put forward, I also sent it on to one of the Scottish Government officials. Okay. Obviously, when the Supreme Court judgment was made, um, the people who uh, had been witnesses at the time were proved correct that the data sharing aspect was ruled to be unlawful. Uh, you expressed your disappointment with that judgment. Uh, could I ask you why you were disappointed? There seems to have been a perception made that we were disappointed because of a view that we had on the Scottish Government policy, and that's quite incorrect. We were disappointed because obviously the Supreme Court had made a judgment on data protection which we clearly hadn't advised either uh, in total or uh, otherwise as, as we perhaps should have. I would say of course that it's been recognised that the bill uh, and act was approved by the uh, the, the appropriate, well, certi certified in, in this parliament as being human rights compliant and the inner and outer houses of the court of session uh, were satisfied that it was a, a human rights compliant. And yes, as I say, it's a reputational damage that we had. It wasn't anything to do with the policy as maybe has been suggested by other people. Uh, th thank you for clarifying that. The, the, the disappointment therefore was that there had been a misunderstanding about the advice that you had given to the Scottish Government, you were disappointed that they didn't accept the advice that you'd given, is that correct? The disappointment was that we hadn't uh, fully appreciated the points that the Supreme Court were raising. Could I, could I ask this time, to what lengths have you gone to ensure that the advice that you've given to the Scottish Government for the new bill is both accurate and legislatively competent? We've worked with the Scottish Government. Maureen herself has been involved quite closely. We've uh, used our legal colleagues in Wilmslow. And uh, as you've seen in the evidence here, we think that the uh, bill as uh, put forward is compliant with the data protection side, but we do have, as every other witness seems to have, reservations about the code of practice. Uh do you, uh, have you given any advice on that code of practice to the Scottish Government? Yes. Um, Could I ask what that was? The, the advice has been that as it stands, uh, given the time frame, given the, the commencement of the General Data Protection Regulation in 2018, that the illustrative draft code of practice is not fit for purpose, essentially. Um, that it has to take cognizance of the, the GDPR. It particularly has to look at the fact that it's public authorities that are doing this and that GDPR does have certain restrictions for public authorities. <coughs> Thank you. Just a final question. Um, obviously, there was um, some confusion about the letter of advice that it was on uh, various local government websites, etc., that, as I understand, it was written in 2013. And you quite rightly amended that advice in light of the Supreme Court uh, judgment. And that was 2016. Were you surprised that there was still the old letter of advice that was uh, being used for um, the implementation of this policy? The, we've, we've put the, the letter out, we put a clarifying letter out <coughs> after the, um, the judgment was issued. Uh, it's for the local authorities themselves to train their uh, practitioners in uh, how the Data Protection Act applies to uh, the work that we're doing. Um, and some have chosen to retain that because there are parts of that advice which are still valid. That that's part of the confusion? I don't know that it is part of the confusion, to be honest. I mean, we, we, we've, we, we added to that advice with the Supreme uh, Court's decision. Um, I think the confusion is going to be in terms of the code of practice that uh, is before you now. Okay, thank you. Could I, have, sorry, could I yes, just sorry. clarify just on the issue of disappointment? Part of our disappointment was the fact that, and not for the first time, and it won't be for the last time, the courts disagreed with the ICO as the regulator. So the court is the final arbiter, and we can, we can have a, a view as the regulator in interpreting the Data Protection Act, but the court can always disagree with that view, and that was, that was our main disappointment. It happened over the issue of the definition of what was personal data, which is pretty fundamental, 
and we then had to go back to the drawing board over that. So in terms of expressing our disappointment, it's just the fact, as I say, that the court as the final arbiter disagreed with our, our particular view of where we were at. Thank, thank you for that clarification. Clarification. I was just trying to get at the fact that whether it was a political disappointment or whether it was actually to do with uh, the process, and you've clarified it was to do with the process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tavish. I was so tempted to say something about courts, but I, I, I won't. Um, I wonder, just to, to follow on from Liz Smith's line of questioning, the UK Data Protection Bill was introduced in September. Will that change the landscape? In some ways. I mean, it's a fairly a comprehensive bill. It's 200 pages long, and its purpose is to um, bring the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which is a piece of EU legislation, into British law where there's been a derogation made to member states, because a regulation applies throughout. Um, what the, the GDPR and the Act do is bring the existing regime up into the 21st century, 1998, it's, um, it was passed. And there's been a huge technological change. And we talk about it being an evolution rather than a revolution and it recognizes, I mean, if you just think about how your technology has changed, 1998, probably very few of you had internet at home and now we've all got it in our pockets. Um, we cast, carry around with us information that would have taken a room in, in days gone by. So it's reflecting that and other changes in technology. It's also... In terms of this in, particular piece well, of legislation yeah. against persons, will it, will it make any difference? Uh, it's, it's enhancing people's rights as well, and I think this is important because, you know, the rights of the individual in terms of the processing of individual, um, whilst they exist to a degree in the existing Act, um, they're, they're enhanced. But there are um, some fundamental changes. One is that there is a much, much greater emphasis on the level of information uh, uh, and awareness raising of what's going to happen to an individual's information uh, between the person who's collecting it and, and the original individual themselves. Now, I should say that many of the things that are in the, the, the GDPR, I think we've been promoting for several years. And one of these key things has been when we've been talking to practitioners about um, whether it's child welfare, well-being, or um, child protection issues, it's always been saying you must engage with the child, you must tell them what's happening to, to their information. And even if you know you're going to be passing that information on, that you do not require consent for that, you still should advise them, because that is crucial to maintaining the client-professional um, relationship and keeping the trust of the child with the adult. You're describing procedures there and yeah. guidance, but I'm absolutely focused here on will this act potentially change what this parliament's being well, asked to consider? I'm sorry yeah. for just no, asking the direct question. I'm no, I, I'm, but, but the, the, the things, are, things are linked because previously they didn't have to, mm -hmm. under the act, give quite so much information as they will have to do in the future. And I was probably just uh, highlighting that, you know, we've been pushing that for, for some time. The other big thing is the issue of consent. Um, and again, we've said very clearly before that if you're going to be passing on information, if you're sharing information on grounds other than consent, then do not suggest to the individual that they can give their consent because that confuses them. And again, because you're going to go on and do that, it, um, it may, may well break down the relationship. The GDPR, uh, talks much more about the balance of power that relates that um, exists between the individual and uh, the the public authority, and clearly, when you're talking about young persons or vulnerable um, vulnerable children, then that balance of power lies very, very strongly in favor of the public authority. And the very fact that you could be asking a child, do you mind if we sh share this? The fact that it's the teacher that's doing it or the doctor that's asking you is enough to say yes, but it's not real consent because it's, you know, it's, it's the power, the dominance of that uh, relationship that's led them to say yes rather than the, the process. So in, uh, under GDPR, the public authorities are limited, much more limited, 
in when they can ask for consent. And of course, that comes down to a lot of the, the balance here. But this is a bill going through the House of Commons and then through the House of Lords. It could be amended and changed well, at any stage. Well, right? the, the con th that condition of processing is with the GDPR. So it's there, it's an EU law. You've lost me. Right. I, I, wait a minute. So I thought this is a well, bill going to the House of Commons, the House yeah, of Lords, yeah. which therefore is subject to primary legislation. It can be changed by no, amendment. The, and all I'm asking, and you've the, lost me most of your answers all the way through so far, sorry. all I'm asking is, can, does that have implications for us, given, given we're considering right. primary legislation in this Parliament? Okay. Yes or if no? I, well, it isn't just a yes or well, no. It, I'm it either is or isn't. No, no because I'll, I'll have to explain the relationship between the three pieces of legislation. At the top, there's the GDPR. The GDPR is a European piece of, reg uh, of legislation. It's a European piece of legislation um, which has taken effect because it's been, been gone through that process, but the implementation of it takes effect next year. We will still be in Europe, and the government anyway said we will be following GDPR. Because it is a regulation, it is automatically part of UK law. And the, the repeal bill that's going through will deal with the post-Brexit side. However, unusually for a regulation, there are a number of things which are derogated to the member state. The new bill that was introduced on, uh, I think, the 14th of September is dealing with aspects which were derogated to the member state. These relate to um, certain exemptions. Uh, they relate to... Uh, issues around children in terms of information society that re uh, relates to matters of uh, law enforcement and it relates to matters of national security. Okay, so the two things go together, but the, what's not been derogated within the GDPR is going to be, uh, has, has to remain the same. And the matter of consent and the balance between the public authority and the individual is a GDPR level requirement and so cannot at this stage be amended by... No, no, make no difference therefore to the thing we're considering here this morning. On, on the element of the conditions of, of processing, it has, it, in, it includes derogations and exemptions, but um, as it currently stands, we would say that it wouldn't because they're pretty much the same as in the existing so act. So you accept my premise that it's a bill and it could therefore be amended and therefore could have an impact? It could have, yeah. but not on, these condition, not on these top conditions of processing such as consent. You've got to be... And this, I mean, this is, if, if I may say, just another issue that comes into the whole thing about the code of practice yeah. and reflects things that the, the, the um, Supreme Court have said about the number of pieces yeah. of legislation that the practitioner has to... To, to deal with. And if you look at the 200 page uh, data protection bill, you'll see it's constantly referring back to the GDPR articles and recital, recitals. So it's not an easy bit to read. If you think the 98 Act is bad, this one is worse, and it just makes it even more complicated for the, the practitioner without a nice clear code of practice. Point on the code of practice. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, may well be that be handy for you to send to us. Uh, some of that information that you've, you've just passed on to Tavish, it might be helpful if you'd write that to the committee. Can I ask Ruth to come in and then join? Good morning, panel. We've um, been taking evidence about um, current information sharing that's in, um, in place at the moment. Can you give us some clarity um, around the current legal requirements that enable sharing of information um, about a child or a young person um, but, but specifically about their well-being, so not the, the child protection stuff, but when we're specifically talking about well-being. Uh, that therein lies the conundrum. I was interested in the previous panel when you were talking about child protection, and no one has got an issue with that. Everyone is very familiar that that's a significant harm, or from data protection speak, it's vital interests. So you have to rely on a specific condition for processing to be able to process information, and that's anything you can do with a bit of information, from obtaining it right on through to destruction and everything in between. The Data Protection Act sets up, if you like, a, a framework. Uh, I think people forget that the, the preamble to the data, current Data Protection Act, and it continues into GDPR, is not just about the protection of information, it's also about the free movement of information. 
Uh, and what the Data Protection Act sets up is this framework to allow for the safe and secure movement, if you like, of, of personal information. So it's not about ticking one box. You have to get all your ducks in a row. Uh, so you look to the, the eight, current eight data protection principles and you have to abide by those. And the first of those is fair and lawful processing. So personal information must be processed fairly and lawfully. And when it comes to lawful processing, you have to be able to meet at least one of the conditions for processing under Schedules 2 and 3 of the Data Protection Act, depending whether it's personal or sensitive personal data. Um, so currently, in order to be able to share information at, at below the vital interests level, you would still have to rely on one of the other conditions for processing. Um, you either rely on consent, which is the first condition in both schedules two and three. Uh, if you're not going to rely on consent, then the, first of all, the processing has to be necessary, as the Supreme Court uh, highlighted, uh, for specific purposes. So the, the very important point about information sharing is about purpose. And everything to do with data protection is in the context of purpose. That purpose will make it compliant or non-compliant. So the, if the purpose is that you have a well-being concern, then I think what we have to think about then are three levels. What you have is the significant harm, and everyone, as we said, is familiar with that. Then you've got a well-being concern that sits very, very low level. And that's what we might term that you, you don't like it. It's maybe not in the best interest of the child, but it's not going to harm the child or anyone else if they carry on doing what they're doing. But there's that little grey area that sits just above that and just below significant harm where a practitioner using all of their experience and professional judgment knows that that child's on a pathway to harm. And that's been the, that it's that little bit there and it's, it, it is just a little bit that makes it difficult for everybody to understand how can you share that under data protection. So it's really about whether you're looking at a public function in the public interest, if it's not health-related data, or if it's health-related data, then the necessity is likely to come up to um, either a public function under enactment, um, or perhaps one of the other substantial public interest uh, conditions that are set out in Statutory Instrument 2004-17. Thank you, the very thorough answer. Um, I suppose, and you kind of answered this, and we've heard some about it this morning, but what degree do you think that this is, that is understood amongst practitioners at the moment? To be honest, I think it's understood almost implicitly for a practitioner. I think we heard from the practitioners today that though that kind of decision-making happens on a daily basis. Um, so what in the, the nearly four years now of speaking about this, it's been... Um, my understanding from practitioners that this is something that they do. It's, it's a, a decision that they face almost daily where they have to make that decision on this very small area. Um, uh, and they don't need to know, and, and this is one of the other things that we've tried to say, is it's not for the practitioner to have to do what I've just told you. I'm the data protection geek in the room, therefore I can tell you what... The, the conditions for processing are, and I can understand them. But that's not the job of the practitioner. That's the job of the data controller, because the liability rests, from data protection terms, with the data controller. That is the local authority, or the private sector school, or whoever it is that's the or organisational entity. So it's not for them to have to sit and work this out. That's for the controller to do, but it's the controller's duty of care to ensure that the practitioner has the confidence and the support in place so that they can make those kinds of decisions. And I, I couldn't agree more with the idea of a flowchart. Again, that's something that we've been saying. Practitioners need that. They need to be able to work through a process. And that's the important thing, that if you've got a standard process, then it is being, it's being dealt with fairly. For every single decision, it's going to be subjective by its very nature. It has to be. But so long as the practitioner has got a process that they work through, then you know that that decision has been made fairly and appropriately. Very helpful. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Uh, Gillian, you've got... Yeah, I want to come back to, uh, to have a Scots line of questioning, just to clarify some things. Um, Dr MacDonald, so as I understand it, GDPR comes from Europe and the aspects that will affect and then persons legislation, the legislation that we're looking at right now, 
are in GDPR and won't be affected by anything that happens in the, in the UK government, that any decisions and, and amendments won't change that. Is, that. is that what you're saying? Well, we can't guarantee what changes will come in in relation to the various derogations that have been left to the UK government. But mm -hmm. as it stands at present, uh, we are satisfied that the changes to the uh, th through the Data Protection Bill uh, wouldn't affect uh, <coughs> this bill. Because um, one of the things that um, we were told by the, well, it wasn't so much told, but uh, an opinion was given by the Law Society is that we should suspend our legislation till we find out what's happening at the UK level. But from what you've told us today, I mean, I, do, I disagree with that anyway. I don't think we should. But from what you've told us today, that there's no point in us hanging off on this at all because GDPR is the top line on this and everything that we're doing here is compliant with that. Not, not quite, because GDPR is there. There is the, the bill that has a number of exemptions uh, that, uh, which will Im or may impact on, on data sharing. We do not know how that bill will change in the interim. And so, in respect of what the Law Society were saying, there is an argument that maybe you should wait until there's an absolute certainty. But we do have degrees of absolute certainty, if you can have degrees of absolute certainty. Um, we know that the GDPR, where the GDPR applies, and certainly the code of practice uh, could have been uh, drafted in a much more GDPR compliant way than it is at, at, at present. And I think that would have been helpful. In terms of the bill itself, it's, we're really talking about the code of practices where the flexibility can come to take into account anything that happens at the UK level? As far as the bill is concerned, we're satisfied that it's not going to be affected by uh, the, the Westminster legislation. Right. Okay. But the code of practice, which of course is integral to the implementation uh -huh. of the bill, may well be. But the bill itself yep. is, is what I'm concerned about. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Daniel? I'd just like to come back to Maureen Falconer's uh, comments about the, the grey area. I mean, do you think that Shinari <coughs> provide a, a adequate criteria by which to assess that grey area? And do you think the bill could have or should have done more to really establish those, those well-being criteria to, 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 make those, uh, to make that assessment clearer I'm for practitioners? Not deliberately opting out or copying out of this, but I, I don't think that's an area that I can comment on, to be honest. Fair enough. Do you want me to continue my yes, mainline please, question? Please, please. So I, I've got some questions following on from uh, GDPR and its impact specifically around consent. So while I accept that, that you know, the, the bill may be kind of GDPR compliant in your eyes, GDPR will have an impact on how uh, practitioners will use it specifically around consent. Is that a fair assessment? And, and what, what kind of additional requirements around consent, especially considering imbalance, do you think GDPR might imposed on practice actually carrying out these duties to, to consider? The, the big issue on, on consent under GDPR is uh, pretty much inability for public authorities to be using it where there is this imbalance of power. And of course, in the sort of, cer certainly in the higher level well-being type issues where the child is moving towards the vulnerable stage, then it becomes less and less um, likely that con consent could be used as the condition on, on which to process. Um, there can be the, the, the other um, conditions such as Maureen has uh, issued, uh, mentioned, such as there being a legal duty um, or it being in the public task, and we might have to look more at that in the, in the code of practice. Uh, one, one of the things, again, reflecting perhaps uh, uh, GDPR and its emphasis on uh, informing the individual. I think perhaps more needs to be said up front in the code of practice about that. Let's get the message across to them first, the, the individuals, what's happening to their information, and then move into the issues around how you're going to pass that on if consent is deemed to be the appropriate vehicle. So uh, one comment that came from the Faculty of Advocates that the, the, the bill should have included a, a, a requirement to consider whether to seek consent 
um, in, in the bill itself. Is that something that you'd ag agree with? Um, I'm not really sure how that would would work. Um, I mean, uh, because the data protection framework overrides everything in terms of uh, information sharing, and ultimately the data controller should be aware of which condition for processing they're using, implicitly they have to be considering whether consent is the appropriate basis or not. So it's probably duplicating something that you should be already doing, and I'm not sure how you would evidence it anyway. Okay. Right, thank you. Uh, Oliver. Thank you, convener. I've uh, been listening uh, carefully to what you've been saying around the GDPR, both uh, in relation to Daniel and also uh, Tavish before. Um, the committee wrote to the Cabinet Secretary uh, asking whether he'd be able to produce an updated version of the illustrative code. Uh, and in his response on the 26th of September, he came back uh, and said, and I quote, the committee, I'm sure, will understand that all of these recent developments make it difficult for the Scottish Government to produce a further illustrative code of practice uh, at this stage uh, that would be reflective of a legislative framework in the UK that is not yet clear. Do you think, given that the key aspects of the GDR in relation to this bill are pretty much fixed, that actually we could see an updated illustrative code that would be more reflective of the likely sort of legal parameters we're, we're working within? Well, the, the, the GDPR was, was passed in uh, 2016. It was finalised in 2016. So certainly um, that framework could easily have been brought into the code at this stage. And do you think it's possible to update the code to reflect some of those concerns at this point, and that would possibly help uh, scrutiny of the bill? I would have thought that there's sufficient information for, in terms of the legislative framework that it could be done. Thank you. Um, and my second question was, uh, you said before uh, that you weren't totally satisfied last time. Are you totally satisfied with the bill this time? We're, we're, we're satisfied that the, 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 the bill as it stands um, meets with the requirements of the data protection regime. We, we think it fits. And uh, just sort of the next stage from that, are you satisfied that it's compliant with the Supreme Court judgment? We, we don't rule on, on human rights. The, the issue of compliance, I do think, will come down very much to the supporting uh, code of practice. And, uh, you know, the, the, the issues were about the relevance of the information and the excessive nature of the information. And, of course, the excessive, where, where it becomes excessive moves into your, your, your uh, human rights aspects of intrusion and privacy. Um, really, really, the code of practice is what has to be addressed. Would you say it's impossible to scrutinise that interaction without knowing what's in the final code of practice as the bill's currently drafted? I think it would be difficult for you to uh, be absolutely definitive in your con con conclusions until you see the final code of practice. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Joanna. Sorry. Um, I, I do feel this conversation is a, a million miles away from a teacher or a support worker sitting with a child in the classroom, and I think that's part of the issue in terms of even an understanding of the responsibility. So you say that the data controller would sit in the local authority. The individual um, professional has to have a duty to consider whether to um, provide it or share information, would they be obliged, would there be a test that the data controller would create to ensure that they were compliant? What's the relationship between the data controller and the person who's got a duty to consider and what would you consider reasonable evidence that they had considered? I think if you look at the difference between the two data protection regimes, the, the current one and what's coming down the line in May next year, the, the fundamental difference is accountability and governance. And whereas currently data controllers are required to comply with the Data Protection Act, come May they will be required to evidence that compliance. 
So from our perspective, if there was a, an information sharing complaint that found its way to us and we were looking at it as a regulator, we would be looking for that evidence. So for, for us, it would be, well, what sh shows your workings? What was the decision-making process that led you to decide to share that information? Um, and we would then look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, which that whole duty to consider is on a case-by-case -case basis anyway. So the duty, to the duty to consider would require evidence. The data controller would, be able, would have to see that there was evidence for an individual decision, and that evidence presumably would have to be written. Don't know. It would be for the, the local authority. If we just take the local authority as opposed to the, the health board or the other named person uh, service providers. But uh, it, it's for that local authority or that data controller to put in place the appropriate processes whereby frontline practitioners can work their way through this legislation. The expectation would be that you would expect, if there's good accountability and governance, that a local authority would have to put in place um, a regime for every individual person within the local authority who may have, who have a duty to consider to share information. There would need to be evidence that there was a process yes. and that they complied with that process. Not yes. just that there was one, but uh -huh. they, they understood it and that they complied with it in every single instance where they are making a decision to share information. I, I don't think we'd be really expecting them to comply in absolutely every single instance, but we would expect them to have the process. They would have a recording mechanism. One of the crucial things, and I think this is actually goes back to your very introductory remark, is that they need to train their staff as well. And that's one of the big issues that we have when we're taking forward enforcement action, is that probably in 90 odd percent of cases, the organization has failed to train or you give a, a very basic cursory uh, uh, training in data protection at induction and then it's forgotten. And crucial to this uh, is keeping the staff aware, keeping them aware of their, their, um, their, their rights and their duties, how to go about it. And again, this comes back to the code of practice being a document that they can refer to, processes that um, allow the staff um, to be confident in what they're doing. Again, what we've said before to practitioners is if you're in doubt, speak to someone about it, speak to your line manager, speak to somebody else. And in doing so, you don't actually need to mention that it's little Jimmy. You know, you put forward, as one of the other speakers said, you put forward a scenario. This is what I'm facing. What's your view? Talk to your, your fellow professionals. And then, you know, as you make that decision, you'll say, I've spoken to, to, to uh, other colleagues and our general view was that this should have been shared for the following reasons. It would all have to be written up in every instance where there was a decision, there's a duty to consider whether to share. It has, it has to be written up why you decided and why you didn't decide and who you spoke to. I, can I just <laughs> clarify on that, that from our perspective as the regulator of the data protection regime, then it, we would not necessarily be coming in to um, look at or question or investigate whether someone had carried out that duty to share. I, do, I don't see that as being our responsibility. Our, our responsibility would be on what basis did you share the information? Whose responsibility so, is it then to ensure that, I mean, in legislation, uh -huh. somebody has a duty to consider mm -hmm. and to show evidence that they considered, whose responsibility is to ensure? I think that would probably go, depending on whether the, um, the subsequent legislation for the complaints process is then um, reenact, reenacted, is it going to be reenacted or taken through Parliament as it was previously because it had been revoked. But I would, I would imagine that whatever the complaints process, and I think it was, if you're not satisfied with the, the data, con well, the, the legal entity, you would then go through the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. So I think it's probably the SPSO that would be looking at that duty to, to, to consider. I don't, I don't see us, uh, as regulator of the Data Protection Act, looking at that duty to consider. The individual making the decision not only needs to ensure that they comply with the data controller, 
in order to have this accountability and governance. We need to also be answerable to the SPSO or be exp exp I don't, expected. I, I don't know. Yeah, the, I mean, the, I'm talking about the, the original complaints process that uh, had been put through, um, gone through the, the legislative process was that the SPSO was going to be handling, but it would be the final arbiter, if you like, of complaints for, for this. Whether the Scottish Government intend to, to do that again with the new bill, I, I, I don't know. You would have to ask them. But from our perspective as a regulator, it's about what condition for processing, what was your legal basis for actually sharing the information? So the duty is now no longer to share, because under the old Act, that would have come under what we consider to be a legal obligation. That's no longer there. So there has to be some other condition for processing that's going to allow that sharing. Obligation to consider that we need to be evidence? Yes, but that's not something that we need to, to look at. For us, it's, it's the legal. What legal basis did you have for sharing the information? We wouldn't, we wouldn't be regulating as to whether someone actually carried out their duty to consider. But if they considered and then shared, you would be looking at it, surely? Yes, yeah. yes, but it would be the legal basis for the actual sharing that we'd be looking at. Right, thank you. Uh, Colin? Thank you, Vera. I'd like to just come in the back of something that uh, that came up when Daniel Johnson was asking questions. Reading the submission from uh, Information Commissioner, as a layman, I would say it's quite difficult to understand when, for example, a local authority could rely on consent and how that would how that would work. And again, I think Maureen Faulkner actually said something to the effect that as a child was becoming was going down the road to becoming more vulnerable, it becomes even more difficult for the local authority to take action, to obtain consent. And yet you would think that there's going to come a critical point in that path where they would have to take action in any case. It, do, it, it doesn't seem to hang together. I think the, what GDPR is attempting to do is to um, force public authorities as creatures of statute to rely on what their statutory responsibilities are. And you'll find in GDPR it talks a lot about public authorities and their, their public task. And that's where there is a job of work for public authorities to work out exactly what is their public task. Because there has in the past, there, there has been a lack of understanding uh, in relation to the conditions for processing that allow people to use personal information. So very often the default position has always been consent. But very often that it's been meaningless because individuals have not had real choice uh, over consent. It's been, we're going to ask for your consent. No, I don't want you to do that. Oh, well, I'm sorry, we're going to do it anyway. And that's disingenuous. What you, the, the public authorities have to look to is their statutory functions, their statutory tasks, their public tasks, and then if it's for a public task, they need to question whether consent is the appropriate condition to be relying on or whether it should be public function in the public interest. But is there not a possibility that uh, vulnerable children and so on will be put at risk because local authorities will be averse to taking, taking those decisions in the future? I don't think they, sh they should be, absolutely not, no. I do, I do think that the Supreme Court decision has possibly um, encouraged a belief that consent is the only way to share information, and it is not. And when you're moving into child protection issues, there's other legislation and other duties that uh, professionals working with children and young people have that will enable that uh, sharing to take place without consent and the crucial thing which we were saying before is that do not ask for it in these situations where you know you have to share it because you have moved on to that threshold into um, you know more serious issues in child protection because you're going to share it anyway and you'll break the trust between the client and the child and that will do no uh, service a good service to them at all. I mean the Supreme Court judgment said that information can also be disclosed if its disclosure is necessary for the exercise of a statutory function. What does that mean? The, uh, the public authority, whether it be local authority, health board, police, have got the duty to do a, a particular task, then, and that information is necessary for them to undertake that task, then it can be shared. 
So, in other words, you don't need the consent. And that would cover vulnerable children and adults and so on as well, if they were caught up in that particular statutory exercise. I, I, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say that I, I think this is where you cannot take the, the, the burden, if you like, off of the shoulders of the frontline practitioner. Because at the, at the end of the day, it's always going to be a decision that the frontline practitioner has to make. Uh, and that's why it's incumbent upon the organisation to make sure that the policies, the procedures, processes, protocols are all in place to give the, the frontline practitioner the confidence and the support that what they're about to do, they're doing in their professional judgment. Um, and and it's, it's about getting that bit, that bit right. And I, I, don't, I, I don't see why the data controller cannot have for the practitioner, as I've said already, that the process flows that in the event that you're faced with this situation, here are the questions you need to ask. If the answers to those are yes, you go here. If they're no, you go there. And walking the practitioner through that decision-making process to decide whether at the end of the day this is information I need to share. But oftentimes that's something that the, the frontline practitioner is going to feel as a professional person. Does consent always have to be in writing? I mean, would you expect a child to be competent to sign? It doesn't. Again, GDPR is quite explicit and says verbal consent is perfectly acceptable. How is that evidenced? Well, I, it has to be done through process. So you have to have a process by which that's, that consent is, is recorded. Either the practitioner is going back and writing up notes uh, and taking you through a process. Again, it's for the, the organisation to say, in the event that you are going down a consensual route, this is the process that you follow in order to obtain consent. In your evidence, you talk about having the ability to withdraw that consent at any time. Again, how would that be evidenced? Well, would, they, would it be just a verbal? It, it, it could be verbal, it could be in writing, and we would certainly encourage it to be in writing, but situations are, particularly with, with vulnerable um, children and young people, that writing wouldn't be... Uh, possible, but we also have to give our put our trust in professionals, and you know we all trust professionals on our day-to-day -day interactions. Um, and this is just another example that they should be doing it. It's something that you know the local authority, as employer, will have in, will, will have um, trained them in. It's their expectations. If they don't follow through these processes, then it's not so much data protection, but it's more em employment duties and. Uh, disciplinary grievance type issues. But if you're dealing with vulnerable people... Points call. If you're dealing with vulnerable people, isn't there the risk, if you're using a verbal system, that you could get into disputes as to whether someone had, in fact, withdrawn that consent? It's just, it's just one way of, of, you know, I think what GDPR, again, is trying to say here is that you don't lock people into a, a specific way in which you can only uh, withdraw your consent if you go down this speci specific process. GDPR is attempting to give clearer, more emphasised rights to individuals in terms of control over their personal information. So if you're going to rely on a consensual model, that's absolutely fine and it's right and it's proper, but you have to understand that if you're going to do that, the individual has the right to with withhold consent or indeed to withdraw that consent at some, pro, uh, some way down the line. So again, it's for the organisation to have processes in place that if they're relying on a consensual model and then that individual withdraws their consent at some point, there has to be a suitable process for that to be, to be gone through. And part of that might be, if, it is, if it's done verbally, this is how you would then record it, if you like, within, within the system. Oliver, finish by Oliver. A very, very brief supplementary. I just wanted to clarify something uh, Maureen Faulkner had said. Um, that in terms of creating an individual duty, you're sort of effectively saying that it's not possible to detach that duty from some level of individual responsibility or accountability within an, an organisation when it comes to data practices. Is that, is that right? No, 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 I wasn't saying that, no. Okay, so you're saying an individual can have a duty 
So where an individual's got a duty to sort of record or manage their own data practices, it can be someone else's sort of responsibility if that goes wrong. Is that is that how it works? I'm sort of thinking where like, Sorry. I'm thinking like where like an individual named person, you know, in the event that this all goes ahead is recording and taking those sort of evidence decisions. If they are not compliant with the sort of processes within an organisation that an organisation has put in place as sort of safeguards or checks, would that person, in terms of data regulation, would that individual be responsible for not following data practices? Is that how it's seen? Not, not necessarily. Okay. Um, it can be the, the liability and responsibility under data protection always rests with the data controller unless an individual does something knowingly, recklessly and willfully uh, against the, the normal process, doing things that they know they shouldn't be doing. That's what we call currently a Section 55 offence. But if, if I do something wrong because I haven't followed process, I've made a mistake in some way, then still the, the liability for data protection rests with the organisation, the data controller. That doesn't mean to say that the data controller won't then discipline the individual. That happens. And if you look at uh, the action that we've taken on our website, you'll see that although the data controller might bear the wrath, if you like, of the ICO, it might not be something that the data controller has done itself. It's one individual that's perhaps done something wrong. But it might be because there's a lack of training. It might be, for a, you know, there's not good technical patches in place or good processes in place. But ultimately, it's the data controller that has the liability. That's really helpful, and I'm sorry I didn't do a very good job of explaining what I was looking okay. for, but thank you. <laughs> uh, Claire, very briefly. It, it will be brief. So just for clarity, essentially what this means is that if, if for instance, I, did, uh, I breached confidentiality as, as, as a nurse, um, that I, but I did that deliberately, I would be liable, not the data controller, because I have willfully done something. So employment law still, still applies, employees can still be disciplined for doing wrong yes. within get so yes okay thank you very much uh, in that case that brings us to the end of this evidence session can i thank you very much for your attendance today that was very helpful thank you uh, this takes us on to agenda item three two things oh sorry i thought you were Okay, uh, agenda item three. We have two pieces of subordinate legislation which are listed on the agenda. Both of these are subject to the negative procedure and I'll take each in turn. Do members have comments on the instrument regarding the teacher superannuation and pension scheme? Uh, I declare an interest as somebody who is in receipt of uh, a pension so just before we okay. have any vote. Thank refer members much. to my register of interest that I was a teacher and therefore superannuated pension is something I received. That's noted. Uh, any other comments? I should note that I'm in the scheme as well. Oh, it's I'm all, com it's all whether, coming out now. I'm not telling you whether I've reached the age of getting anything back yet. Not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> any other comments outside of somebody who's making money out of this? Okay, right, in that case we'll move on to the next one. Do members have comments on the instrument regarding individual learning accounts? MD in receipt of one of them. Okay, right, in that case. Right, in that case, uh, thank you very much. That's the end of the public session, and we'll move into private session. Thank you.